when I was trying to put together this talk, I was thinking uh, of an essay that Edgar Allan Poe wrote called The Philosophy of Composition. I don't know if you've read it, but it's, it's one of the strangest essays, I think, around. It pretends to tell you how Poe constructed his fiction and poetry. But in fact, it's a bunch of lies. And you can read it as that and have a really good time reading it. You can tell that Poe was worried that people thought he was delusional because of the way he wrote. So he tried to be very logical. He said, for instance, that he wrote The Raven using a mathematical formula. And it doesn't, when you look at the essay on the surface, it does seem logical. But when you really think about it, it's just ridiculous. It's somebody trying to rationalize the fact that he knows he's probably a little strange, but he wants the world to think differently. But one of the points he makes in that essay is that there is no better topic for a good poem than the death of a beautiful woman. And that in itself we could talk about for an hour and a half. We won't. But when I was thinking about it, uh, and I thought about that because I don't, it, it, it sounds bad to me. It just sounds all wrong to me. Uh, I thought about the way Florida writers are obsessed with what we could say is a dying state. Uh, Florida is a swamp developed by rich white men for tourists. And here we are in the middle of it, literally, uh, some years later. And every year, a little bit of natural Florida is eroded or disappears. That is the common theme in most of the Florida crime novels written by people like John D. McDonald and Carl Hyacinth. It's the theme of my own ethical vampire series, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And when I first moved to Florida in 95, I started reading as much Florida fiction as I could in order to try to decipher the culture. I'm still working on that. But uh, my husband and I, my husband was a magazine editor um, before he moved here. And we both were reading these stories and talking about them to people we met. And one of the people we met was an editor at the University Press of Florida. And she invited us to put together an anthology of Florida fiction, which is the book there, 100% pure Florida fiction. I didn't know when I agreed to do that book just how much work it was going to be. We ran ads in Poets and Writers and the AWP Writers Chronicle, which are the two publications most creative writers read. We had a graduate student assistant who went to the library at UCF and did searches for us and came back with more than, I think it was 600 some short stories all set in Florida. And then we had to read them all. And then we had to agree on roughly, I think, 21 to include in the book. But we did it, and it was fun, and we learned a lot about Florida. And I'm going to read just a bit from the introduction to the book, which I wrote all by myself. The husband didn't take a part in this one. The theme of many a Florida story is nostalgia, longing for a past that never was, regret for what might have been, Discovery not of the fountain of youth, but of a paradise lost. Perhaps one reason for that nostalgia is the relatively recent development or overdevelopment of the state. Unlike the New England story, haunted by rich colonial history and bound by tradition in its land use, architecture, and customs, and unlike the classic Southern story, whose roots lie in past glory and whose present celebrates eccentricity, the Florida story tends to be more brash, yet more uncertain. Retirees, snowbirds, natives, all are at odds with the alligators and the heat. Strip malls, instead of post offices, libraries, and courthouses, are the landmarks of our communities. Abundant fast food outlets, trailer parks, and pawn shops reinforce a sense of transience. Gated residential communities are bordered by the ghettos of the poor. Contemporary Florida, we decided, is a place where nature and society conspire to make the everyday world seem surreal. So we ended up with 21 stories, uh, written, some written by famous writers such as Joy Williams um, and Allison Lurie, and some by, actually two of them were by former students of mine. Joni Mitchell wrote a song that said, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. John D. McDonald said in Florida, they don't know what they've got because they arrived too recently to know that it's even missing. Ambition, appetite, and an absence of memory have lain waste to a once exquisitely delicate environment of wetlands and beaches. So what we writers do by 
trying to capture the nuances of Florida culture and landscape in our work is really an act of preservation uh, more, more than anything else. Because what's here today may not be here 10, 15 years from now. We may be right here in Orlando, be coastal in 15 or 20 years. And these kinds of concerns have deeply influenced my own writing. Elmore Leonard is one of my favorite authors. I hope you all have a chance to read him. He's got the best dialogue of almost any writer ever. He's not that heavy on description. He's more dialogue driven, as I said. But uh, when he does it, it's really pretty good. Here's a passage. A, he had a pathologist character in one of his books, Tourist Season. Um, Dr. Allen determined that Greater Miami had more m mutilations homicides per capita than any other American city, a fact he attributed to the terrible climate. In warm weather, Allen noted, there were no outdoor elements to deter a lunatic from spending six, seven, eight hours hacking away on a victim. Try that in Buffalo and you freeze your ass off. Several other Sunbelt coroners had conducted their own studies and confirmed what became known as the Allen Mutilation Theorem. The weather plays a part, not only in these novels, my novels, but the stories that are in 100% pure Florida fiction. Uh, we have extremes here. We are known for our heat and humidity, and most of us are informed. Our characters are changed by the weather. So using the weather as a character in a Florida story is almost commonplace. Uh, just as in other regions, people use the cold as a character. I'm going to read a little bit from Bad Monkey. The Flamingo Isles was not a classic Miami Beach motel. There was nothing charming about the color, silt, or the architecture, early Texaco. At this motel, there were no striped canvas awnings, no wizened retirees chirping in the lobby, no lawn chairs lined up on the front porch, no front porch whatsoever. Basically, the Flamingo Isles was a dive for pimps, chicken hawks, and hookers. Rooms cost $10 an hour, 15 with porno cassettes. One of the things about Hyacinth's work is he describes how bad things have got in certain areas of South Florida, but without any commentary on it. He seems to just take for granted that people are brutal, inept, and inconsequential, which is a pretty bleak philosophy. Um, he says, in Florida, nothing connects, but everything coincides. This is a society without basic repressions. There are no dirty secrets here. There's a poet called Campbell McGrath. Anybody know his work? He has a new collection. Um, he, he says his Florida for him is an asphalt dominion, um, a monstrous embodiment of a nightmare. This is getting bleak again. Um, he says Florida's great cathedrals are merely malls and theme parks. It's between the extremities of the exotic and the vulgar and of dread and hope that his poetry runs its course. All right, bleak, bleak, bleak. 